Okay, here's one on balancing nuclear reactions. So we have five nuclear reactions here, and we want to know which one is correctly balanced. And so this can look a little daunting, but this really isn't much different from balancing chemical reactions, balancing chemical equations, right? Uh, but instead of, uh, instead of making sure that everything looks good, it, in, instead of changing stoichiometric coefficients to get quantities of atoms uh, the same on both sides, we're looking at mass number and atomic number and making sure that those add up to the same number on both sides. So uh, remember on the top, we've got mass number and then atomic number on the bottom. That's how nuclide symbols work. So let's make sure that they're, the, let's find the one where everything is balanced. So for this first one with mass, on the left, we have 238. And then on the right, we have 232 plus 4. Right, we have an alpha particle, so 232 plus 4 is 236. So that changed, right? We need it to be the same on both sides in order for it to be balanced. So that changed, and so that does not work. Now let's look at the second one. So for mass, let's look at mass first. Uh, we have 249 plus 15, so that's 264. Then on the right, we have 260. And then we have a, uh, this neutron has mass 1, and there are 3 of them. So 260 plus 3, we get 263. So again, the masses are not balanced here. So that does not work. Now for C, again, let's look at mass. Uh, and uh, we've got 2 plus 3 equals 5. So we've got a deuterium and a tritium. And then that goes to 4 plus, the neutrons are 1, but there are 2 of them. So 4 plus 2 is 6. 5 to 6, again, masses are not balanced. Now let's go to this uh, uranium uh, nuclide. We've got 238 plus 1. So mass is 239 on the left. And then on the right, we've got 239. So that looks good. Then let's go to atomic number. On the left, we have uh, 92 plus 0 is 92. And we're left with 92 on the right. So again, that looks good. And so that one is going to be D. Uh, just to be thorough, let's finish up. Uh, mass right here is 40 on the left. And then on the right, 40 plus 0 is also 40. So mass works out. But then atomic number, we've got 19 on the left. And then this is a positron here. We've got 20 plus 1. So uh, it's not minus 1, right? We've got 20 plus 1. That's 21. That one does not work. So, which is good because we already figured out that D works. So again, we're just looking at uh, mass numbers and atomic numbers, making sure the sum of these values is the same on either side. So that's one on balancing nuclear reactions. Okay, let's try one regarding collision theory. So this says... Factors that affect the rate of a chemical reaction include which of the following? And so this is this is the format that they like to use a lot. We've got three statements with Roman numerals, and then it's the old one and two, one and three, two only, two and three, etc. So we have to we have to we have to treat these as three separate true or false statements, and then see which ones are true. So number one, frequency of collisions of reactant particles. So how often are the collisions happening? So that certainly does affect the, the rate of a reaction, right? The, the more often collisions are happening, the faster the reaction is going to go, right? So if you have, say, a certain number of particles in a reaction vessel, if the reaction vessel is very, very large, such that it's very sparse and the, and the particles don't find each other and collide as often, the reaction is going to go slower. Whereas if everything is very condensed and they're all close together, 
the, the probability of a, of a collision occurring is much, much higher, and a collision must occur for the reaction to take place. So if the collisions are happening more frequently, the reaction is going to go faster. So this one is certainly true. <clears throat> Number two, the kinetic energy of collisions of reactant particles. So with what energy do they collide? This also does affect the rate of reaction, right? Because we know that in order for a reaction to occur, the particles must collide and they must do so with sufficient kinetic energy so as to get over the, re the, the activation energy of the reaction. Remember on an energy diagram, that hump, that hump right there, that's the activation energy. So if the molecules are moving very slowly, which would occur if it was a low temperature, right at a low temperature, the particles would be moving very slowly. If they don't have enough energy to get over the activation barrier, they're just going to bounce right off of each other, right? But if they're moving very fast and they slam into each other with a lot of energy, they're going to be able to get over that activation barrier and it'll go to completion. So the kinetic energy of the, of the, uh, of the kinetic energy of the collisions of the reactant particles, uh, that does affect the rate, right? The greater the kinetic energy, which means the higher the temperature, the faster the reaction is going to go. So that is also true. Number three, the orientation of reactant particles during collisions. This also matters, right? Because when two molecules collide, let's say they're two diatomic molecules, and this one wants to react with this one, but this one does not react with this one, then if they collide this way, those are not the correct atoms that, that, that will, uh, th th these are not the atoms that will result in a collision that will allow the reaction to occur. They'll just bounce right off of each other. Instead, right, they, the, the molecules have to be oriented in such a way that the correct atoms collide that have the ability to react with one another. So orientation of reactant particles also matters. So that one is true. That means that one, two, and three are all true. So that one will be E right there. Okay, we have a problem regarding kinetics, specifically regarding initial rates data. And so this says the table gives us the results from a rate study where we're going X plus Y yields Z. So we don't care what the substances are. Starting with known concentrations of X and Y in experiment one, the rate of formation of Z was measured and we got R. We're, we're just keeping it nice and simple. We're just saying the rate is R. Right, we're, we're, we're just using a variable there. If the reaction was first ordered with respect to X, so we have first order, and then, we, uh, and then second with respect to Y, we have second order with respect to Y, uh, the initial rate of formation of Z in experiment two would be, so, we, so uh, 0.4 and 0.1 concentrations gave us R, now we have different concentrations, but we know the order with respect to these substances. So we should be able to calculate what this rate will be. So uh, it's going to be some multiple of R, right? It's going to be a fraction of R or a multiple of R. So let's start out with R, okay? Now, we know that uh, this is second order with respect to Y. And so when it's second order, that means that the that the that any in, uh, any increase in rate is going to be the square of the increase in concentration so if the concentration doubles the rate must quadruple if the if the concentration triples the the rate must increase by a factor of 9 right 4 16 etc so uh, I definitely students tend to get used to things doubling and looking for doubling and quadrupling. Um, but be careful because that can backfire, right? Because you could look at a rate that quadruples, uh, but if the concentration also quadrupled, that's a proportional increase. That's still indicative of first order. So just be careful there. But we, we, what we're understanding is that if this is second order with respect to Y, if from trial one to trial two, the concentration doubles, then the rate must quadruple, right? Second order, so two squared is four. So let's put a four there. So looking just at y, we've, we're concluding that the rate should quadruple. However, looking at x, this is first order with respect to x, meaning that whatever the increase or decrease in initial concentration, the rate will increase or decrease proportionally. So if it doubles, 
If the concentration doubles, the rate doubles. If the concentration triples, the rate triples, etc. Uh, so, but here it cuts in half. From 0.4 to 0.2, the initial concentration of X is being cut in half. That means that the rate must also be cut in half. So these two uh, substances are having different effects, right? The changes in co initial concentration are having different effects. So that has to be cut in half. So let's cut this in half. So we started with R, and the change in Y makes it quadruple, and the change in X makes it cut in half. So 4R over 2 is 2R. That's all there is to it. So X, uh, Y was making it quadruple, X was cutting it in half. So overall, the rate, the initial rate for, for trial 2 will be double that of trial 1. So that's a very good problem about initial rates that is helping you think a little bit more abstractly. We're used to looking at numbers and calculations, but we also want to just think in terms of proportionality, right? Doubling, quadrupling, cutting in half, etc. because that's the, that's the more important basal logic that has to be there in order for you to then do calculations with numbers. So that's a bit about initial rates data. Okay, so we've got a little kinetics problem here. Uh, at first, it seems like a lot of information, but let's just get through it a bit by bit. It's actually quite straightforward. Uh, so this says the reaction between hydrochloric acid and calcium carbonate is represented by the equation above. So we've got those two producing calcium chloride, carbon dioxide, and water. So two separate trials were carried out using calcium carbonate samples of the same mass, but one sample was a single piece of calcium carbonate. So let's just represent that uh, like this. So here's uh, here's trial one. <clears throat> Boom. And then the and then one sample was composed of small pieces of calcium carbonate. So let's say we do this, right? We've got a bunch of little pieces, We've got a little chunks. So there's trial two. The loss of mass of calcium carbonate as a function of time for both trials is shown in the graph below. So that's just a fancy way of saying rate of reaction. How fast did the reaction occur? And so as we can see, they're both tapering off to the same point here, right? Loss of mass of calcium carbonate. They're ending up in this, at the same spot, sort of the same rate over time. But the initial rates, right, at first... Uh, y, whichever one, right, one of these corresponds with X and one of these corresponds with Y. That's what we're trying to figure out. And X is the one that had a slower initial rate and Y is the one that had a faster initial rate. See, the, this is, uh, we're going up very rapidly. This is much steeper. And so wh which of the curves, X or Y, represents the reaction with small pieces of calcium carbonate and Y? So uh, two, this one here with, this, with the smaller bits, is this one X or is this one Y? So uh, first it says we've got two options that say X, two options that say Y. Uh, it, for the X, because it shows that the reaction proceeded at a uniform rate. Uh, so certainly uh, neither of these show a uniform rate. A uniform rate would be uh, a straight line, right? And uh, reactions tend not to, not to go that way uh, in the first place. Um, but also these do not show a uniform rate. So that doesn't make any sense. Uh, B, curve X, because it takes a shorter time for the reaction to go to completion due to the larger surface area of calcium carbonate. Okay, so uh, clearly surface area has something to do with it, right? Because we've got this block. So the surface area is just uh, right, the, the, the locations on the periphery, on the perimeter of the block that are available for reaction. Whereas when you, uh, when, when you, when you chop it up, you're, you're sort of exposing the inner parts. You're making more surface area available for reaction. So we'll figure that out. Then uh, C, curb Y, because it shows that the reaction proceeded at a non-uniform rate. Again, this is just not really what we're talking about. All of the, It's always going to be a non-uniform rate, so that's not really uh, giving us any information. So then curve Y, because it takes a shorter time for the reaction to go to completion due to the larger surface area of calcium carbonate. So these are saying, uh, these are giving the same reason, they're just giving the opposite curves. So clearly, we do want to understand that the, the greater the surface area 
uh, available for reaction, the faster the reaction is going to go because there are more locations for reactants to meet and for the reaction to proceed. And so definitely uh, it's going to go faster. And we're just looking over here and we're, we are identifying that Y is the faster, has the faster initial rate uh, because this is the loss of mass. We've got more loss of mass faster, right? In a shorter amount of time, right? If we, if we pick a time, right, and just go down here, the, uh, the Y trial loses more mass in that, in that time interval than the X trial, right? So it's, it's going faster. And so clearly, uh, <clears throat> clearly Y is the, it, Y is the faster one. Greater surface area must be the faster one for the reasons we just described. So this answer must be D. Curve Y because it takes a shorter time for the reaction to go to completion due to the larger surface area of calcium carbonate. The reaction is going to, is going to go faster. So that's a bit about kinetics and the particular phenomenon of uh, reaction rates correlating with surface area of reactant available. Okay, here's a quick question on half-life. Gaseous cyclobutene undergoes a first-order reaction to form gaseous butadiene. At a particular temperature, the partial pressure of cyclobutene in the reaction vessel drops to one-eighth of its original value in 124 seconds. What is the half-life for this reaction at this temperature? So cyclobutene is the reactant. And then at a particular, and it's, and it's a gas, so it, exi it exerts pressure. Then the partial pressure, it, it becomes a mixture as the reactant is producing the product. The partial pressure of cyclobutene drops to one eighth of its original value in 124 seconds. So what, what do we know about half-life? If we're starting out with, with uh, we'll, we'll just call the total uh, amount of the reactant at the beginning, we'll just call it one for, for simplicity's sake. sake. After one half-life elapses, we're going to have one half of what we started with. Now, now the, a common error is to think that, well, after one half-life, we have half, so after another half-life, it'll all be gone. Remember, that's not how half-life works. As we have less and less reactant, the, the rate of reaction gets slower and slower because with fewer reactant molecules, the probability of a reaction also goes down. So the half-life is constant. We keep getting half of what we just had after each half-life. So after another half-life, we'll have half of a half or a quarter. And then after another one, we'll have one-eighth. And so what we're saying is that here's one half-life, here's two half-lives, here's three half-lives. After three half-lives have elapsed, we should have one-eighth of the amount of cyclobutene as when we started. Right, so, uh, and that's what it's asking for, one eighth. And so th if three half-lives have elapsed, and remember that the half-life is constant, it is a certain value for whatever reaction we're talking about, and that is 124 seconds. So three times the half-life equals 124 seconds. So to get the half-life, we just have to divide by three. That's all there is to it, right? If three half-lives elapsed and it took 124 seconds, then one half-life, is a third of that. And that's what we're looking for. So you can do this on your calculator or you can just think about it. 120, a third of that is 40, and then a third of four is 1.3 repeating. So about 41.3, so that will be right there. So we had a few different ones uh, to try to throw you off. 124, so that was, that was the half-life. Or maybe you went too far, you thought it was four half-lives because you took two and multiplied by four to get eight or whatever other kind of logical pitfalls that you might uh, find. But remember one to a half to a fourth to a third, that's one half life, two half lives, three half lives. Take the total elapsed time, divide by three, that's gonna be your half life for this reaction. So that's a quick review on half life.